Dr. J, delighted to have you on the big middle. I'm glad to be here, Susan. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, this is uh, something I enjoy doing and um, so glad we finally got to hook up and meet each other. Absolutely. It's been some time coming. Now, I love your backdrop. Uh, where are you? You've got two bases and um, one is pretty exotic relative to the other. Yeah, I'm uh, my first base is I'm Charlotte, North Carolina in the United States, where I was born and raised and practiced medicine for 24 years. And now I'm currently in the Dominican Republic in a small little town called Las Terrenas and um, kind of been down here most of COVID and uh, enjoying it, enjoying doing my online consultation work and uh, not sure exactly when I'm going to get back to America. I'm sure that that's in the cards too, because you know that's my home base. But uh, for right now, I'm in the Caribbean and it's pretty wonderful. Life is loving you and you're loving it there. Well, yeah. good. Now, yeah. the Real Food Twitter family is how I discovered you. It was via sugar addiction psychologist, Dr. Jen Unwin. Now, she's a committed low carb, as you and I know. I've had her on the show along with her lovely husband, Dr. David. She was praising you for helping her out of a weight loss stall. And she told me it was more than fine to mention you. And uh, you had her, well, I guess, is she still one of your clients? Yes, she is. Oh, great. So lovely you, woman. Yeah, she's amazing, isn't she? And, yeah. and, and this is it. You, I'll, I'll get you to fill in some of your background uh, in a sec, but this is your terrain, isn't it? Midlife women who are trying all these tried and tested methods that are very popular now, you know, dropping the carbs and coming from a really healthy baseline already, because most women, let's face it, relative to men, um, <laughs> have been calorie accountants all their lives and have really focused on their health because that's the world we've we've grown up in. That's how we're conditioned. So, so tell me about how you came to specialize as your Twitter tag is at Hormone Diet Doc. How, how are you a hormone diet doc? <clears throat> Well, you know, this started a long, long time ago as I began to get out of medical school. And um, one of my mentors was a woman by the name of Tori Hudson, Dr. Tori Hudson. And um, we had a special relationship and um, she was eager to teach me and I was eager to learn uh, understanding female and hormonal balance and, and some of the the, the challenges that women go through uh, all through life. I mean, you know, from the you know, times that, that they're, you know, pre, pre-menstrual all the way through what happens with the hormonal changes into perimenopause and menopause or whatnot. And, um, you know, I think I caught on early that, you know, doctors will tell you that, you know, most of them, 80% of the patients you're going to see are women. And I think it took, um, I think I got that I should probably get to know this, you know, this demographic that going way, way back. However, it led me on a journey. I had no idea that what would end up happening is over the last 25 years of, you know, practicing medicine clinically, that it would become pretty much all that I do. And so 95% of most of my clinical practicing years was dealing with women who were making either hormonal shifts and didn't know how to navigate that, or it was leading into thyroid problems or ovarian problems, infertility, polycystic over, ovary syndrome, things like that just became what it is that people sought me out for. Um, and so I began to be, you know, did, I, I enjoyed it and I built a data bank of knowledge and expertise in how to navigate this hormonal things that fluctuate with women. And so now it's led into, you know, kind of what you said, where in the space that I'm in now, it's in women who are having challenges with metabolic health. Um, that could be, be, you know, it could simply be that they are having an inability to lose weight where they used to be able to lose weight just fine with a couple little tricks. Um, but now because of the shifting of the hormone, hormonal landscape, uh, they, they're finding that th those simple things no longer work and they're looking for why that is. And I have a pretty good knack of teaching them what has changed that sets up the playing field to be a whole different now. You've got to approach it 
in a different manner than what you used to have to do. And so, Absolutely. Well, we're going to dig into all of that yeah. because this is, is so fascinating for all listeners of the big and men, women in general, because we come so we become so frustrated and exasperated because, yeah, you know, sure. we're healthy all our lives. We follow all of the advice. We exercise like maniacs. And then suddenly you hit 39, 42, 45. It's not working. So it becomes very difficult. But I want to first um, sketch out your background, get you to rather, because you are a functional medicine doctor. You're an integrative med- medical doctor. I mean, you are someone who who is a detective you dig into the root causes tell us how you came to be doing that and if you wouldn't mind a line or two about your own health struggles um how i came to do this is a long story that we can't we don't have the time to get into but it had a whole lot to do with um me thinking that i wanted to do one type of medicine which is really to pursue the path of um alopecia pathic medicine and to be a surgeon um, and then getting some information that kind of blindsided me of, I don't think I want to be, have anything to do with that type of medicine, that palliative care patch somebody up. So it began a journey for me that ended up with a lot of traveling in Southeast Asia and, and places that I became familiar with what in, in other parts of the world where they look at someone and they think of health in terms of if a person is not well, how do you nurture that person back to health? So how do you regain health when health is not present? So that was very, that was fantastic to me because it resonated with me because it was such a different approach than how do we put a Band-Aid on something and give someone a medicine or a surgical procedure that is at best going to eliminate some discomfort for a period of time, but is doing nothing to address the root cause of this problem. So that's what started it. And then I, you know, you know, I, I went through my schooling looking for every opportunity that I could to get more into an integrative, holistic type of working with people of let's look at where this dysfunction really came from. And it led us into deep into nutrition and some psychology, um, stress management, how to use more natural tools and nutrients as opposed to synthetic prescription drugs or whatnot. So it's been a long, long journey. But And and your own health recovery story. I mean, you were learning all of this and you applied it to yourself. Yeah. I mean, so what happened to me is I got, while it was, I was doing all of these things that were based in natural medicine and and still working with women on hormones. um, I just was not paying attention to myself at all. In, In the terms of I was eating a diet that I was taught that that was a reasonably healthy diet. It was full of whole grains and lots of vegetables and keeping protein lean and moderate Um, and staying away from saturated fats and using more low fat vegetable oils and things like this. And through the process of doing that, I put on, you know, close to a hundred extra pounds than what someone like me should be carrying. And it took a way, a big wake up call for me, uh, to realize that I need to address something. And I went back and started learning and applying what I know about hormonal health to the way that foods react in the body. And it led me down this um, pathway of understanding about something called energy toxicity or metabolic dysfunction because of eating too much refined carbohydrate in the presence of certain oils that leads to insulin resistance and then your body does not know how to handle glucose anymore. And so you store all this energy away and you can't release it. So anyway, I began to teach myself this and apply it and um, it changed my life. And it's been, it, it's become the cornerstone of what I work with people all the time now is to how to regain kind of like their, their metabolic health again, so that they can be healthier and leaner and all that kind of stuff. And how long ago was that where you feel you could say, I, ch- I changed myself and I'm recovered? 
that's been about between four and five years ago when that started. And it happened very quickly. I dropped a lot of weight in less than a year. Um, and I've bounced up and down a little bit, well, you know, like anybody does. But I've been able to ma you know, maintain keeping most of that off for, you know, close to five years now. And to me, so it's just the answer. It's just the it's always the home base to go back to. And uh, it just works. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I know that you agree with me. We are on the same page about so many things. There is no one size fits all. And when right. you have the insulin resistance, sensitivity issues, and then you layer in the menopausal stuff, which we are definitely going to be talking a lot about as we go, um, it just gets very complicated. And sure. that's why, I mean, ketogenic eating, very low carb, worked for you. You dropped a lot of weight. And, you know, I could put you in the ranks of the many men where that works. But for us women, it's yeah. it's just not something. And I, I love how you have moderated the approach that you you set your your midlife women clients on. You did say they were mostly women. So let's go through initially um, what changes at perimenopause that makes it so frustratingly hard for us women. You know, I, I experienced it at 39, where suddenly I had chub on me and I, whoa, where is this coming from? And I was eating the six meals a day and the handfuls of almond and half a cup of porridge, you know, doing all of that, which I thought was super healthy with the blueberries on it. So what happens at perimenopause? And then we can get to what happens at menopause and then postmenopause. Okay. Okay, so uh, the best way, well, I'm going I'm to walk you through kind of like uh, what happens in the hormonal cascade of a woman who is moving from, let's say, uh, 42 years old, could be as early as 39, like you, Susan, but usually somewhere in the you know, 41, 42 years old. Here's what begins to happen. So you have two primary female hormones um that is estrogen and progesterone what's important about these two is that they work in sync together and it's very important that they stay within a very tight ratio uh so it's not about what happens with the levels of testing the levels of these hormones it's about the ratio between the two of them so the first thing that happens in your early 40s is that progesterone, which is predominantly thought of as the hormone that, that helps a woman get pregnant and stay pregnant, but it does so much more of that. And doctors miss this all the time, thinking, you know, that pitching hole of progesterone because it does so much more. But anyway, as progesterone begins to decline and estrogen levels are not going to decline for probably another five or six years at least. Now what's happening is that that the ratio between those two, two hormones is getting further and further apart. Now, this automatically leaves a woman in what we call an estrogen dominant state because she doesn't have enough progesterone to antagonize the estrogen that she's producing. So the first thing is going to happen here is that since estrogen competes against thyroid hormones to get into the cells of your body, if you've got unopposed estrogen running around in the female body, it's going to win this battle to get to the receptor site. So then thyroid hormone is going to come along. There's nowhere for it bind to bind to. So it can't get into the cell to tell the cell and the mitochondria to burn energy through oxygen. And this is because the differential, the ratio is no longer good between the progesterone and the estrogen. This is the dropping of the progesterone and the unopposed estrogen that's running around the system. Now, there's so much more to this meaning that we could go down the rabbit hole of women are ingesting more exogenous estrogen than ever in our lives. We're getting it from plastic bottles. We're getting it from uh, utensils. We're getting it from cooking ware. We're getting it from the pesticides and the fertilizers we use on food. So women are being bombarded, men too, but women are being bombarded with all this extra estrogen in our environment. Now you've got the progesterone that's supposed to combat the extra estrogen to make sure that it doesn't run wild and do crazy. So now you've accentuated this whole problem. Yeah. Now that's going to lead to what I said of estrogen binding up sites that now the, the thyroid's going to become suppressed and the metabolism is going to slow down quite a bit. 
Now, the confusing thing is, is this won't usually be picked up on a thyroid blood test because a thyroid blood test is looking at how much thyroid hormone do you have floating around in your bloodstream? Well, you've got plenty of it. It just can't get to where it wants to go. So the woman will be told you don't have a thyroid issue because the TSH level is normal, but she's showing all of these symptoms of hypothyroidism. She's having a problem with, she doesn't sleep well throughout the night. Her energy levels are suppressed. Skin might maybe getting to be dry. She might be moving towards uh, a little bit on the constipated side. Um, eyebrows, eyebrows thin out to almost Eyebrows disappear. thinned out. Uh, at this stage, she might be a little bit more cold than normal. Now that, that can flip into menopause. But um, anyway, all these symptoms are whatnot. But the big one is, is just the metabolic effect that has dropped out. Mm -hmm. That's just one piece of it. Now and this what's is happening, most of your clients in perimenopause. Most of my okay. And then it goes further in the fact that with any stress that is going to go on in this person's, this female's life, and we all have stress. And sometimes it can be just the stress of the separation of the estrogen and progesterone that I talked about. But with any, any accentuated stress in this woman's life, now that declining progesterone levels that she has is going to all be used up to make the stress hormone cortisol, because that's how you make cortisol is you start with progesterone, you make a conversion to it in the, in the adrenal gland of the body. So you're robbing even further progesterone, which is separating estrogen further and you're making cortisol which is going to put the brakes on fat loss like 100 percent so it's yeah. a fat storage facilitator fat storage hormone, and main, mainly in the abdomen more than any place else so these women are finding why am i gaining abdominal fat when i used to not can't get rid of it now you've got this elevation of cortisol low progesterone too much estrogen and the thyroid gland is not working as well now you throw in there the last piece of this mix as you're getting further and further into perimenopause you're also dropping in testosterone which we think of as a male hormone but women need it just as much as men but it's such a metabolically active hormone that is keeping your lean muscle mass up and burning fat like crazy and keeping your energetic and all this kind of stuff and cognition. so it's decreasing as well so this is where we find that no longer for this woman, when you are already, I hate to use this word, but I'm going to, you, you'll understand what I'm talking about. When you're already handicapped with these hormones dropping significantly at this age, and they're all metabolic. So they're, they're used to being able to, it's a big part of like how you partition calories and burn calories or whatnot. So as they're dropping, this idea of eating the true ketogenic diet yeah. of adding massive amounts of fat into your diet just for the purpose of to get into ketosis so that you can hopefully burn some fat for fuel all gets thrown upside down because you're in fat storage mode now the last thing that you would want to do is to pack your diet full of more fat than you would need so you've got to you've got to manipulate the macros at this point for this woman and say we need to shift two things one is we need to prioritize protein far higher than a true than a the traditional ketogenic diet mm -hmm. and we need to drop back on the fat and we need to keep the carbohydrate somewhat on the lower side and if you do that if you make that shift to prioritize the protein and drop the fat back keep the carbs low you find at least you've got a baseline for what's going to be the best diet for these women, probably all the way throughout menopause. So in your, your Twitter tag, you spell that out in every single post that you make. Give us your Twitter tag. It's simply capital L C H P M fat M M F, right? Moderate so, fat. Yeah. So we want to moderate, we're going to drop the fat back. Um, because you think of it this way, if you look at the diet and you think thought of it as a seesaw. Okay, and the lever of the seesaw is protein. So if you prioritize the protein and you keep that as something that you're using for satiety, you're using for stimulating muscle 
gross because that's going to burn more fat um, and all the other great things that protein does. If you keep that on the high side, then the other side is, is you have carbohydrates and fat, which makes the thing go up and down like this. Yeah. So, so then you get to play around a little bit with, you can teach someone that you could at any given time go for more fat in your diet by pretty much eliminating carbohydrates altogether. And this is what some of the carnivores do, right? Yeah. Um, that can be a strategy. A better strategy for the women we're talking about would be to give them the freedom to maybe eat a little bit more carbohydrate in their diet. And rather than for them shooting for these numbers like 20 grams a day, they could go up to 50 grams easily if they bring their fat down to being more in the range of like 40% of their total calories a day than the 75% that somebody, you know, following the traditional ketogenic diet would. Yeah. So, and it just works better for them anyway. Yeah. And I suppose too, they get the satiety kick from the protein as opposed to the fat, which flatlines the insulin production. Exactly. So you can wake up like I do. I mean, I don't know. I feel like I'm an outlier, a total weirdo, because I did the two years of uh, keto religiously. Yep. But I, I think because I was zero fat, no fat, no butter, calorie account all my life, it was always plant based. I was veggie for a long time. I think I, I was always thinking, no, 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 this doesn't feel right. But I did sort of add in nuts and things. And then I backed away from them. But I don't know I what's happening with me because I'm still carrying a lot of fat, but I don't add extra fat, but I boost protein anyway. But just so we don't lose sight of that's perimenopause, what shifts, if anything, at actual menopause when you have a 12 month cessation of your periods and then right. postmenopausal, if you can bring us through what you counsel your many clients for those stages of menopause. So the only thing, Susan, that's really different about this is the addition of now of, of falling estrogen. It doesn't really modify of changing the diet anymore as far as it, it, it's still going to be to a woman's advantage to prioritize protein and moderate their fat for sure throughout all of menopause. But now when you throw in the deficiency of estrogen is where you will see the symptoms that a lot of women complain about of hot flashes, night sweats, vaginal dryness, further problems sleeping because they wake up between one and three in the morning, hot and sweaty. So these are all estrogen deficiency symptoms. So now you've added like that whole piece to the thing. Yeah. So the, it's where it, it does, again, it doesn't change a whole lot about what the dietary strategy should be at that time from, you know, middle or late perimenopause. What it does is, you know, I'm a big believer in you need to figure out what you need to do to stay in hormonal balance. And I think where I get frustrated a lot with the space that I play in is there's too many people out there touting that you can do it all through diet. Yeah. And I'm here to tell you that's a bunch of garbage. That's not the way that it works at all. I mean, if you could do, if every woman that I work through going through hormonal changes should, could get perfect hormonal balance and sleep and no hot flashes or whatnot just by dietary changes, then that's the only thing that we would ever need to talk about. But it doesn't work that way for a lot of women. And so you need to find out where do you get the right information and what you're willing to do about this? And so I mean, we have, have like, to become your own health detective. Extraordinary. Part of that for sure. I'm and lucky I have time, to, yeah. but a lot of women, a lot of my friends, they just say, Oh, Susan, thank you for telling me about this because you know, they've got three kids and they're all difficulties with their partners. I do a lot of digging and I have to say that, you know, coming to the same conclusions, listening to you on Twitter and, and some of the, some of the other people who who don't preach this evangelical mode of this diet is going to change your life. No, there are so many more factors involved, aren't there? There really are. And and, and again, it's um, diet is such a huge part of it, but it's not a, a completion for many women have hormonal issues because of things like nutri nutritional deficiencies. You know, we've been living for a long time in a world that the topsoil is depleted of most of the mineral balance that we have. And um, 
There are a number of reasons stress is a factor because it causes your body to use up B vitamins at a rate of about 10 times faster than somebody who had no stress in their life. So there are so many complications here. And so that, that you know, I, I get a little frustrated by the people who are like, if you, if you ate the, the perfect diet or whatnot, then you would never even need to consider something like nutritional supplementation. Well, maybe not for you, but maybe for the woman that I saw last week who, um, you know, benefited from taking some activated vitamin B6 called pyridoxal 5-phosphate, which then allowed the ovaries to produce more of her own progesterone, which then made her sleep better at night and she feels less stressed and feels so much more even killed. Yeah, maybe, maybe that was a good decision for her, right? So you have to be willing to look outside the box sometimes and say, you know, are there some other areas I could look at like nutritional supplementation? I'm also a big fan in certain cases of women using bioidentical hormone. It, yes, you know, and I must say that we call, we used to call them bioidentical. I know that in the States, it's all about compounding at pharmacies and things like that. Now the term that we're using in the UK and continental Europe, because I've been through all this, is body identical. And these are sort of the yam base, not the pregnant mares, that sort of stuff. So we've kind of adopted that term, but that hasn't carried over to the States, I guess? Body identical? No, it has. We just, it, it would be term different, Susan. When we talk about bioidentical hormones in the States, we're talking about bioidentical in the fact that this is the absolute same molecule yes. that your ovaries and adrenal glands produced. And so it is, it's bioidentical, body identical. Yes. There is no synthetic basis of this whatsoever. Now, there are people, I can't say that it's perfect because there would be probably companies that are producing something that they call bioidentical hormones that would not be necessarily plant-based here's the reason all right let me tell you about that there's a big difference out there and women need to understand this a lot of women will use something like um a cream that is made from diascorea which is known as the mexican wild yam okay and they will be either told or they will believe them themselves that they that this is progesterone there's nothing about that. This is progesterone. Now, you can take wild jam and you can convert it with one simple chemical addition. You can turn it into completely natural progesterone. Right. But nothing from, wham, from yam without that conversion made to it has anything to do with progesterone other than the fact that if you were so early, like say 35 years old, you could use some you could take some of this diascorea and it would push your ovaries a little bit to produce some more progesterone. But, but when you've got a woman- It's not body identical, can, yeah. Well, it's not only body, no, but it's completely safe. I mean, it, it is coming from something that is actually a vegetable, but it's not strong enough. When you get a woman into her mid forties, who actually you need to bump her progesterone levels up higher than where they are, you're not, you cannot do that with wild yam cream. You can and do this it is with the stuff we see variations on the theme in the back of women's glossy magazines. And all, I mean, this is hawked ad nauseum, all of these different concoctions taking advantage of, you know, the uneven messaging we get from doctors who are not up to speed on, yeah. on hormones, it's female unfortunate. hormones and, yeah. and their the legion. Stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that, women that, get the victimized by this. Right Sorry, I'm talking over you. Go ahead. I'm just going to that it, the industry is not regulated really well. And it's unfortunate because, you know, people are out spending a lot, a lot of their own money on things that are fairly useless a lot of times and a lot of times harmful. Um, so, well, yeah, as it, you know, we're on the same page with that, too. I mean, I'm a big believer in body identical regulated, tightly regulated um, uh, these hormones, hormone replacement therapy. And I mean, the, the piece is we are living so much longer after menopause. We could have 40 years if we're lucky, you know, right. for Pete's sake, you and they promote bo bone health and yeah. cognition and there are so yeah. many upsides and the breast cancer risk is no longer an issue i just did point people to the interview i did 
uh, recently with Dr. Zoe Hodson here in the UK, talking about how testosterone, as you agree, it's vital in the mix as well, and how we deserve all these hormones. I mean, I don't want to diminish my health for a hormone deficiency that can be easily safely fixed and right. along with the supplements that that you talk about too because that's right. the missing piece too isn't it with with all of this oil depletion we're not getting the right minerals so that can further exacerbate some of these hormone deficiency issues can't it absolutely um it's a big it's a it's a big piece because like i said a lot of it comes from soil depletion we they're the our food's just not grown with a lot of nutrients like it used to be. The other one is we, again, we talked a little bit about this with estrogen, but it goes into the nutritional thing. We are bombarded with so much internal stress from our environment. Again, with these PCBs and the, you know, the, the exogenous estrogens and the pesticide runoffs or whatnot, all of these things, your body combats all of this and has a beautiful mechanism through your liver to be able to detoxify things and get it out of your body. But there's an expense at doing that. And that expense is you're going to drive a pathway, which means you're going to burn through nutrients at an accelerated rate in order to detoxify these things you want to get out of your body. It's just a whole nother reason for it. it's tough to eat a diet that is nutrient dense enough to make up for you know, some of these things that you would be far better off on just starting with a good plant-based multivitamin as an insurance policy that you're not going deficient in something. And then, you know, there might be some other things that can be really useful. You know, like, you know, I work a lot with women who need to clear out this estrogen dominance. There are wonderful phytochemicals that come from cruciferous vegetables or something in broccoli that's called indol 3 carbonyl and when you ingest it by eating broccoli, your body turns it into another chemical called diendoloyl methane, which we, we know is DIM. DIM is wonderful for keeping a woman's hormones balanced. The only challenge with it is, is that you'd have to eat a, so much broccoli in order to get the therapeutic dosage of it that these women that I might work with who you know, would be better off taking a, a concentrated supplement of this than trying to, you know, sit around and eat 14 cups of broccoli every day. Yeah. But there are wonderful yeah. tools out there. Yeah, I've heard of that. I had no idea that it was rooted oh, it's a in, wonderful in, thing. in broccoli. Because I probably need that because I've been on body identicals for more than 10 years. And I worry that I've got too much. I only take one pump of, of the um, body identical estrogel um, because, you know, I'm... I'm a curvy woman who's prone to gaining weight anyway. I don't think I need more, but I get confused because one person says, oh, estrogen is the fat burning hormone. Oh, no, it's not. It's a fat storage. And you, your head just starts spinning because you don't know who to believe and who to trust. So I, I think because it can start if you're estrogen dominant, is there a problem with you end up manufacturing estrone? Is that, well, is that a problem? It's not. Uh, let me clarify that for you. So a woman has three types of estrogen. She has what's called estriol, she has estradiol, and she has estrone. Okay, out of those, um, estradiol is the one that's most known because that's the one that's usually supplemented back into a, a, a menopausal woman. Um, that's the one that started the whole problem because it was synthesized from mayor's urine. Uh, and caused it's a synthetic version made in a laboratory that we now see sparked all kinds of like reproductive cancers, breast cancers. And that like was that. progestin. And that was the Women's Health Initiative study. That was the type that was being used. And it's much different than the micronized progesterone that we can supplement well, with now. Absolutely. Right. So there's no there's no there's no true relationship between a progestin and progesterone at all. And this is a shame for women because they often where we will see this show up a lot, Susan, is, you know, when women go on birth control pills early in life and they stay on them for 15 years, that two things are going on. One is the way that birth control pills work is they trick your body into thinking that you're pregnant already. So if a lot of women are out there and they their body has been thinking that they were continuously pregnant for 15 years, you've got a 
you've got to question whether that's a good idea, right? But the biggest problem is, is that they will tell you or you'll get this information that you're on, say, a progesterone based birth control pill, and that's better. It's never progesterone. It's always a progestin. And progestins, progestins confuse the female body so much and cause so much more problems than they ever will be beneficial of that it really needs to be like eliminated. But we know how it works. It's going to probably be a while before they put it all together. Yeah, and we unwittingly take this stuff, as you say, for 15 years before we want to maybe try for a child. And what yeah. would the side effects be of that? Would, would it uh, instigate PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome? or It certainly can. I Typically, what you would see is um, it would knock out a person's libido. It will increase belly fat and weight gain because the body doesn't understand it as true progesterone. Um, it's going to lead to, um, or potentially will lead to both anxiety and depression and sleep problems. Um, it's a, it's kind of a, it's not a good mix. And still handed mix. out by primary doctors like Smarties yeah. to most women who say, Oh yes, I want to, I don't want to have a baby just yet. Put me on some birth control. And right. I mean, what would the alternative be just since I've got you? And of course, I want to get back to the, the big middle years. But just since I've got you, what would you what would you give someone for birth control? Would it be some sort of a I don't really or that's outside of my um, I don't really feel I don't I don't really get into that anymore. Yeah. Okay. Um, if I my, my suggestions would be this, if you can. In terms of hierarchy, a woman looking for birth control, probably her best bet if it's going to be something outside of learning her cycle and when you can't actually have, you know, intercourse or whatnot, I would have to suggest something like a, a traditional IUD, like the copper IUD. Um, you know, you're placing a barrier there that is very effective at preventing sperm to enter the cervix and whatnot. Uh, that's probably best. The second one would be again, an IUD, that is only delivering a localized hormonal effect um, that's not getting into systemic circulation like the birth control pill that you're swallowing yes. every day, which means it has to go to the liver first, which is the big complication to get the liver involved in that. So there are you know, there are a number of me methods. Um, well, that people was don't very really, helpful. Thank you so much for, yeah, people for don't really giving seek us that. Me out for that type of thing too much, but. Well, we have, you know, we're learning that we can't trust. I mean, it's horrible to say because I don't like to engage in, you know, regular physician, general practitioners here bashing them because they, they have an enormous, expansive yeah. degree of knowledge about certain things. But, you know, there has been big pharma, the corporate capture thereof, you know, we need more detective work done and we need to be, we're all learning. We have to be our own advocates and dig into this stuff, but it's painful to know that you can't just take as read what your right. general practitioner tells you. Right. So right. I, what I want to do is I was I was speaking with um, your partner, Heidi, and yeah. we, I plotted out a certain course of play for this for this podcast, and I've completely ignored it. So rather than <laughs> rather than lob you specific questions, Dr. J, I want to mine your impressive Twitter feed because that's how I discovered you through Jen Unwin and Dr. Unwin. And I'll get you to elaborate on individual posts. So, I mean, I was spoiled for choice. I mean, you're very active. You're, I, I literally, I told you before we opened the mics, I would be a conveyor belt for all your tweets. Right. So I have to moderate my, my <laughs> impulse to click, retweet, click, retweet. So anyway, here's one that I want you to take on. I'll read it out. We have been unknowingly and without consent, the subjects of a 40 to 50 year food experiment and the results equal complete metabolic disaster, obesity and type two diabetes. I'm asking to halt that trial due to unfavorable results. And then you talk about bringing in real food and I love your tweets because you always sign them off. Thank you, keto hashtag and your very personal hashtag, uh, low carb, high protein MF. So um, dig into that for us about this failed experiment. Well, the experiment is this, is um, we know, I mean, there, uh, we could talk about this forever. There was a fellow by the name of Ansel Keys who started this whole idea that the problem 
that was causing Americans mainly to have such a high rate of cardiovascular disease was due to primarily saturated fat and the amount of cholesterol that came along with that into the diet. And what happened was this was the beginning of the promotion of reducing saturated fat in the diet to by which means by default that if you're going to reduce saturated fat in the diet in order to have a taste of it, that anybody's going to eat it, you automatically have to increase the carbohydrate nature of that diet. So you, you really have to replace in some fashion fat for sugar or it's not palatable anymore. Yeah, and we got hyper palatability and the sugar industry is behind all this. And right. I would I would suggest at this point, because I've covered the Ansel Keys kind of um, cholesterol con and all of that quite with Ben Bickman and Tucker Goodrich and loads of yeah. people, Graham Phillips. Yeah. So rather than go down that, um, but I appreciate that's completely where you come from, um, the, the failed experiment. But even though we know all this or a certain segment of the populace knows all this, we are still we are still being told zero fat, no fat. I mean, there's a certain, I think almost the majority of healthcare practitioners and influencers, they're saying, oh, sugar's not toxic. I just read an Instagram post um, the other day. Sugar's not toxic. The people who are fear-mongering about sugar need to be silenced. I mean, it was ridiculous. Yeah. Well, that all comes from this. Um, what, what, is, what, you can't change what we're talking about until you get people to recognize that the flaw starts here until a doctor or scientist understands truly that carbohydrates are not the preferable fuel source for the human body. Then you're still talking about that everything is built on a carbohydrate based model which means that this is why you need to never stop eating carbohydrates you need to always eat four to six times a day because you can't dare let your blood sugar run low without enough carbohydrates because carbohydrate is the fuel of your body in order to perform all the tax taxes that it does until you can get them to realize that go back and read the science and understand that our whole evolutionary and ancestral diet would have proved that we are more efficient at burning fat for fuel than we are carbohydrates, then we're in a mess, right? Because yeah, they're, they're still coming from that model of you've got to have carbohydrates. If they realize that you did not, and, and the science is right there that, you know, you can make carbohydrate out of protein, you can make carbohydrate out of fat. You can't make fat or protein out of carbohydrates. So one of those things is not really necessary to the human body at all. And it's carbohydrate. Yeah. Now, not to say that you know, people should not eat any of it, but you absolutely we make enough of our own to sustain us anytime you want, anytime. You want. Yeah. Well, um, but there's also at midlife, there's even for people who are not insulin resistant, they remain insulin sensitive there seems to be a carb intolerance that develops. Would you agree with that? I might, I might frame it in a different context and say that what happens is it's about, it's about energy and it's about the ability to, are you, are you in a position where you are better at releasing energy or better storing energy? And people in midlife are absolutely moving in the direction of that. Now they are becoming far better at storing energy because of these deficient hormones than they are at releasing energy. So carbohydrate intolerant might be another way for saying any eating more carbohydrate or even probably the same amount that they're used to 10 years earlier is going to probably show up with um increased girth right it's going to show up as more fat tissue or whatnot now the other thing that we haven't talked about yet and we'll touch on for one second is that so these hormones are re estrogen is stored in your fat tissue mm -hmm. so when your body starts to get really deficient in estrogen it wants to store more fat cells because that's the where it's going to put any estrogen that you can make 
So now you got to look at that equation too and go, okay, it's set up, it's set up for you to be an energy store and it's set up that it wants more estrogen. So it's going to want to build more or, or fuel more fat cell growth to keep up with estrogen. It, 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 I know it gets a little bit complicated, but it's, no, no, it's, it's, it's just good. a matter of like getting people to understand that the, you, the playing field has changed a little bit in midlife and you can get ahead of it. You can get ahead of it. You might need a coach for a while. Not, you know, some people won't be able to go out and do all of this um, research on their own and put it all together. But there is somebody out there who can help you kind of navigate this for a minute until yeah. you've got your hands on it. And, well, and this is this is exactly what we talked about with Ben Pickman, some of the races, because he did kind of a, a menopause clinic with me, which is, you know, kind of unusual terrain for him with his right. his normal conversation. So very much he was on the same page. But the thing is, though, I mean, you made an apology tweet. Let's move on to that one because then we can get into the nitty gritty of what foods. You said, to the thousands of patients I worked with for the first 18 years of my practice that I told to eat beans, rice, spinach, grains, lean protein, fruit, etc. I am so, capital letters, sorry. Ruminant meat, eggs, fish, pork, and a little avocado, asparagus, cruciferous veggies, and some berries is healthier. Now, looking at all of that, a lot of women who have been calorie accountants or maybe dabbled with vegetarianism, you know, women in their 50s and 60s, we were all sort of around the same time. We listened to the same narratives from the authorities and exercise your butt off to make it smaller or right. reduce your intake because it was all about the energy balance model. And, you know, we get to menopause, it's not working. But a lot of people have difficulty with the ruminant meat message. I mean, where else can you get your protein? The eggs, the fish, the pork. Pork is still, you know, something that a lot of, of people of my vintage, I find, shy away from. Yeah, you'd have to look at why it is that. I mean, is, is that really education and wisdom based? Um, you, you know, you would know my stance on that. I would take issue with the fact that, you know, show me how something like a good, well-raised, hog produces meat that is somehow unhealthy to a human i i don't you know that we could go into that forever and ever, and ever. but i know and no, we could I have do. circular but it's the animal cruelty argument for a lot of people and the feed lots especially in the states here in the uk people who are eating beef it's pretty much grass-fed all the time yeah. and there seems to be less cruelty involved and i really think that that's the the dominant problem with it for a lot of people I mean, I know for me, that's why I was vegetarian, because I just thought, oh, that cow, that poor cow, why would we want to kill it in such a, a, a horrific way without, without even honoring it? And, you know, pump it up with hormones. I mean, the thing is, people don't understand, chickens are fattened up horribly with hormones that are not good for you. You know, monocropping depletes the soil. I mean, it's all a big piece and very fraudulent. And I just find the cycle continues and nobody knows what to eat to be healthy anymore. Well, there's a lot there, Susan. I think one is, is we have an opportunity to clean up um, animal husbandry and do a better job with how we take care of, you know, the process of, um, farm raising animals, but I do not believe that the answer one bit has anything to do with becoming vegetarian. I mean, it's not part of our ancestral diet to me. It's not something that I believe is, I believe a, a well-structured diet that would include animal protein is far better for you than trying to live off of vegetables and nuts and seeds. I think if we look back to the predominant factors of what it is that grew human beings' brains to the size that it is, it was the massive amount of newly available protein and fat in the diet as two things happened. We learned the ability to hunt and we learned how to control fire. That seems to be the tipping point. So, um, I don't, I, I don't have an answer how to, uh, that I would ever make every vegetarian or certainly vegan happy, but I feel pretty strongly that a, a well-balanced, healthy diet that's going to support hormones, strength, 
and longevity is going to include a fair amount of animal rich protein, fish, eggs, things like that. And I think that people can, you know, you can do a better job of where you purchase and what, you know, sourcing this and we can put pressure more on the people that raise these animals to do a better job and make, and make it more friendly. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's building, isn't it? I think people are all just saying, come on, get your game together. You, know? right. you can't keep, keep, keep this up because there's, there, there are enough loud voices that are saying, stop it. You know, we, and you can, if you can honor an animal and have them happy, but a lot of that, you know, plays into the inequality piece and it just becomes difficult because, you know, a lot of really poor people can't afford to get their protein, but it's funny. I had Prof Noakes on and I said, well, what do you counsel South Africans to do? And he said, pilchers, eggs, dairy, and that's what they can live on, on two rand a day. So, I mean, it can be done, but I, I take on board. I didn't mean to get too sidetracked on that. But I just, I'm directing people to your Twitter feed and they are going to see beautifully presented slabs of meat and broccoli on a plate in some of the, the lovely visuals that you put out. So I wanted to put that out there. Now, you also said, be a contrarian. Every bit of it was wrong. This is another Twitter post. Fat is not harmful. Eating frequent meals isn't good. Multiple servings of whole grain is not healthy. Lots of fruit isn't good for you. Long sessions of cardio won't make you lean. So let's go through that one point by point. The fat is not harmful. We're back to Ansel Keys and that whole piece if people want to listen to previous podcasts about that. But it's not yeah. harmful, is it? I mean, it's, it's, not harmful at all. No, it's what it's keeps not. you alive. It is what keeps you alive and it is well balanced. I think a lot of people don't understand a couple of things about fat, like when it comes from animal protein. If you were to take a piece of beef and break down the fat content and it, it's act, most beef actually has more mono unsaturated fat than it does saturated fat. And so you want that mono saturated fat that would come from other places like um, avocados and olive oil or whatnot because they're so heart protective and um it's not the even with the with the coupling of the saturated fat it it when you look in terms of all of the cell membranes in our bodies being made out of these fats that it that needs to be regenerated every minute of every day you would you need fat in your diet you just don't need omega-6, high inflammatory fats and whatnot like that. Um, so when I said it's all wrong, fat's not bad for you, it's, it was not, it, 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 you know, we have a term that you probably have heard a lot where, you know, don't blame the fat or the meat for what the sugar did. Yes. So the, it's not the fat that's the problem. People be, need to be a lot more scared of sugar and refined carbohydrate than they ever do about getting saturated fat in their diet. I mean, the whole point is the overarching message is that the people who eat the, the processed high energy, low nutrient food products, the ultra processed foods, we've got a 50% slice of the, of the um, consumer pie. You've got 60% creating all the metabolic disasters in the US. We're more or less level pegging on ultra processed foods. And sure. that has been normalized as the way of eating. So, it, I, and even especially vegans and some vegetarians are grabbing these manufactured so-called heart healthy snacks, which are really sugar laden chocolate bars by another name. Yeah. Yeah, so the rest of that tweet was things like, um, you know, one of, the, one of the biggest health, one of the biggest things that we can do to, to make ourselves healthier and healthy is the amount of time that we spend not eating food. Um, we have these, these unbelievably metabolic pathways that drive things like autophagy, which is the ability to go in and scrub out old cells and replace them with new vibrant cells. We have these beautiful things called the AMPK pathways that is an enzyme that drives the mitochondria to make it's anti-aging. It makes the, all the machinery work better. But these things happen 
when your body has not been fed for an extended period of time. So this idea of eating six meals a day because there, somebody is scared to death that your blood sugar is going to drop too low and you need more carbohydrates every three hours is not only wrong on so many levels, but it's preventing you from ever experiencing any time in that somewhat fasted state. So this is where, you know, we talk about intermittent fasting. So that, yeah, that was another one that is just absolutely wrong. Human beings probably never really need to feed themselves more than twice a day. And a lot of times one big meal a day would be perfectly fine. Now, there are exceptions to this. If you're an Olympic trained athlete who needs to take in that much calories, you're probably going to have to do more than two. But for the most people that we know, eating two good meals a day is completely sufficient and allows you to go for longer periods of time. I just went through, I quickly, while you were talking, I scrolled through the list of tweets and, and it's all more or less the messages that we've already put out. I mean, you've, you've hit all of the points in your answers before we even got to your tweets, yeah. um, which, it, which is great. Um, I want to give you this tweet because it's new terrain. You said, IBS and most colitis are not caused by a lack of fiber. In fact, fiber may be the biggest hindrance to resolving that condition. Sugar, seed oils, and indigestible plant material alter the gut microbiome, inflame the gut wall, and predispose one to leaky gut syndrome and autoimmune disease, which a lot of women at midlife suddenly get one, two, like buses, three autoimmune diseases. So um, please talk us through that one. Well, okay, so we're talking about inflammation. I mean, we're, we're right off the, you know, any of those terms that I mentioned, IBS, inflammatory bowel syndrome, colitis, anything that ends in the ITIS is an inflammatory reaction. So we're talking about inflamed cells that lined the intestinal tract. What we know about in, in inflammation in the digestive tract is there's two things that would never cause or aggravate inflammation in the digestive tract. That is fat. Now, again, omega, high omega-6 linoleic acid, um, that, that's a whole nother story, but monosaturated fat, saturated fat, the things that we've been talking about lately and proteins. And by the time they've reached the large intestine, they're already been broken down and modified into amino acids. Those two things will never influence or aggravate inflammation. So if something's influencing inflammation in the digestive wall and the microbiota, and it has to do with something that you're eating, you can bet that it's coming from the plant kingdom. So what I meant by that tweet is I often will start somebody off who has colitis or, or IBS or something like this of a very close to a carnivore diet for a period of time that could be anywhere from as short as five to seven days. And it might be as long as two weeks. What will happen during that period of time is almost without exception, all of that inflammation will go away and, and it, it, it just takes care of so much of this problem. Then we will begin the idea of let's introduce plant matter back into the, the diet and find out what those triggers may be if, if any symptoms return. So in my experience, if a trigger does return nine times out of 10, what I see is it's due to bulking agents like fiber. So the people who try to add back in things like whole grains or could be psyllium seeds or flax seeds or you know, whatever it is, that's where we seem to see the trigger take off. So wheat was designed to say, go with what you know will not offend your inflammatory bowel disorder until the inflammation dies down. Your best bet's gonna go very, to be go very, very low carb for a period of time. It just, it works, it works yeah, all the time. It works. And you know, I'll just throw this into the mix not challenging that at all, but gastroenterologists, if you go for those deep dive gastroenterology tests, as I did when I came back and I was beginning my long journey of trying to figure things out, um, the tester at the hospital, you know, I think, you know, he was a, he wasn't a gastroenterologist, but he was the guy that was carrying out the test. He said, I said, well, why is my tummy so much flatter? Because you have to eat for three days, boiled chicken, 
soft white bread. They, they put you on white foods. So it sort of has the same thing. Once you cut out all of the, the plant materials, your body will just calm down for a period until you reintroduce. The well, in that, that case, you know, we wouldn't off. like promote the white bread, but you, you, yeah, you still are. What you're doing is you're, you're doing a lot of things. You're, you're lessening the load that you put on your digestive tract for sure. Um, white bread that has been, you know, soaked or whatnot is going to be fairly benign in the amount of digestion that has to take place for it. So you're really, you're really resting your digestive tract for a period of time, which is going to help anybody out. Cause again, we spend too much time in the state of digesting food is yes. half of people's problems is they are on from one meal to three hours later, they're eating their next meal. They never even get to digest one meal before they start digesting another meal. And that constant process of digesting food is leading to gut microbiome problems, intestinal inflammation, to, um, you know, triggering too much insulin. Um, it, it's just, it, it, yeah, sadly, this is the message that is still going out yeah. uh, by some so-called nutritionists, even right. some dietitians, which have three and four year degrees. They're right. still, you know, promulgating this six times a day, grab a handful of almonds, which of course I did. And every woman who was health conscious, probably of my age, we all did that. We were told to prime the metabolic pump. You got it. And now I, I love the satiety I get from eating the way that, that you promote. And I, I only ever eat one meal a day and I just tighten, tighten down the window. I mean, I am not a lean, mean running machine by no stretch, but I'm cognitively really sharp and happy on this. And it suits me. Now, getting to intermittent fasting, do you have any insights that you can add? Because I find there are different, different theories about when autophagy begins. Is it after 24 hours? Is it 48 hours? I mean, there are loads of people that do these long fasts, which I've done, but it because I have Hashimoto's, it it was a paradigm that didn't really fit for me. There was no yeah. resetting going on. Um, and yet you see Jason Fung and, and some of these other people, Dr. Jason Fung, who wrote um, The Excellent, The Obesity Code. Anyway, anyway, I'm, I'm babbling here. Um, what is your What is your prescription for menopausal women, their version of intermittent fasting that you have found with the many people that you counsel works better than maybe some of the paradigms that, that really work well for, for men, say? Well, as a general rule, I found a sweet spot with um, women to be somewhere between a 17-7 <clears throat> and a 19-6. So somewhere between a six and seven hour feeding window in the day, it seems to be a sweet spot. Now, it's very difficult to talk about the whole autophagy. <clears throat> we do not know. We do not know when every individual hits autophagy at a different period of time. So some, some people can hit autophagy within 18 hours easily. Some people take 48 hours. The reason I don't even like the conversation is because if you understand, it's the same thing that comes up, Susan, when people ask me, do you break a fast if you have some cream in your coffee? The answer to that, and, and, and the answer to what we're talking about is this, if you understand the principle of ketosis, and if we're working within a fine line of usually the people I'm working with, they're going to be ketotic in the morning when they wake up, okay? If you put cream in your coffee, heavy cream in your coffee, and you're already in a state of ketosis, not only you haven't broken ketosis, we, ketosis mimics the same biochemical pathways as fasting. So you've done nothing to disrupt what you're trying to go after as long as you pay attention to this. Now, flip that back to autophagy. You, a person who might take 24 hours to get into autophagy or even a little bit longer, but was keeping their carbohydrate levels low enough that even if they fed themselves, um, you, you are not stopping the process of autophagy because you've already, through ketosis, you've already stimulated autophagy. Through 
the increase in this pathway called AMPK through the mitochondria, which was stimulated as soon as you touched into ketosis or that you went 15 hours without eating, that pathway is already driving, which automatically turns on autophagy. So people, I think a lot of times believe that the only way you get into autophagy is by not eating anything until your body kicks into it. You can get into autophagy through a lot of different, you can take, you can take the herb berberine, which is going to drive AMPK to turn on autophagy and you're, you can't stop that process no matter what you eat. So people are a little confused about what autophagy is, I think sometimes. Okay. I mean, there's just loads of confusion and I dig deep into all this and I still walk away and I go, well, that makes sense. And then you read the flip of it and well, that makes sense too. And so it be, it becomes, you know, it's like a big pile of spaghetti, but no, I really appreciate it because you are very learned and you've got lots and lots of experience with, with, I mean, thousands of patients, don't you at midlife trying to sort through all of these things. What about the role of magnesium? Uh, That's quite important, isn't it? Especially at this time of life. I think magnesium is the most important mineral and the most important thing anybody could do for so many reasons. One is it's the number one worldwide nutritional deficiency because it is the most susceptible to topsoil erosion and disappearing. Um, So about 75% of the world is deficient in magnesium. The other thing is, is that magnesium drives about 600 biochemical pathways in your body. So to even be close to having low levels of it, there's got to be so many things that are not operating optimally for you. So now magnesium keeps cortisol levels down. So it, it keeps muscles relaxed. It helps your thyroid gland produce hormones good. Um, it does so many things that uh, if there was one supplement anybody ought to take, they ought to take magnesium. And do you and really, think it should it, be it, ingested through the system or should it be a magnesium oil you put on your lower legs? I prefer magnesium glycinate. I think that I stay rooted in science. And, 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 and again, I've seen a number of different models of delivery systems and other chelating binders like 308 and stuff like this. Right now, all the, all the majority of the research about magnesium has been done through the chelate of attaching it to a glycine mo- molecule, which allows the magnesium to get through the blood brain barrier into your nervous system. And that's where you want it to be. And so I go with just good old magnesium glycinate to me is the best thing. So you're popping a pill as opposed to rubbing an oil on your legs. It won't get to enough of those receptors. If you're just putting it on your lower legs? It's not my wheelhouse or my specialty. So I'm not going to speak too much to topical versions of it. Yeah. Okay. Maybe it's great, <clears throat> but I'm going to go with what I know. Okay. So dim um, magnesium, what other supplements would you think? Were, I mean, berberine, that's, that's the sort of herbal or herbal. You say herbal or herbal. I'm, I'm, I'm always one foot in the ocean, so I'm never sure whether it's the American pronunciation or, or the Brit one. But that is the herbal plant-based um, version of metformin, which is meant to manage blood sugar levels that are too high. Tell berberine me about berberine. It's an amazing herb that's found about 5,000 years ago in China. It's a, a plant alkaloid that has... Um, now been studied extensively for <clears throat> uh, reversing insulin resistance to getting glucose in your cells better and keeping glucose levels low. Um, it also has, <clears throat> uh, it improves the gut microbiome by feeding the gut proper channels. It also eliminates bacteria in your gut that should not be there. Uh, I, I it drives this AMPK pathway. So it's helping your mitochondria be healthier. So it improves fat burning. It just, it does a lot of amazing things. And, and yeah, I believe it's a much better decision for many people to use it rather than metformin because metformin, although they, they do mimic each other in some of the results of blood sugar and opening or decreasing insulin resistance, metformin comes with vitamin B12 depletion, It comes with confusing uh, a couple of different pathways in the mitochondria that end up being 
not something that you would want to be on long term. So I think berberine is a safer. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that. I also want to get your opinion, Dr. J, on whether we here in Europe, we don't have iodine added to our salt. And the trend is for pink Himalayan sea salt. So are we probably all running around uh, with not enough iodine? Should we all be taking sea kelp? I think it might be a good idea. Um, I was not actually aware that y'all don't put iodine, even in your sodium chloride. Okay. So if you live, people who don't live co you know, close enough to the coast and don't take advantage of eating you know, a fair amount of seafood or shellfish or things like that, and you're not getting any, any of it in your, in your salt supply, um, I would be, I would think that you would want to be looking into that and probably getting some sea kelp or some, uh, you know, Japanese vegetable kind of things in your diet. Um, like the, you know, the seaweeds and the, because too many women that I see are having thyroid disorders all the time, starting in that late perimenopause to menopause. And if it's, if it's simply because they're not getting enough iodine, that needs to get taken care of. I usually tell people in the States, because again, I wasn't aware of that. I usually tell people, um, you know, we would prefer people to use a good sea salt, but I always tell them to combine about a third of it, of just regular over-the-counter iodized salt, so that you know that you've got some iodine in the salt. But um, if you guys have none of it over there, probably a good idea. Oh, that's such a good thing to do, because of course I've got a grinder full of the uh, Himalayan pink rocks and i take sea kelp even though some of the people who um profess to be experts on hashimoto's and thyroid slow thyroid issues they say oh no that's just pouring pouring fuel on the fire and don't touch it and you know again you're left going well what's right and i've just followed my gut and thought no how bad can sea kelp be to add because i did a big search in the supermarkets and even on Amazon for um, sea salt, uh, for iodized salt, and just didn't find any. And I know that in Canada and the US, it's fortified already, it comes iodized. Yeah, I think sea, sea kelp's good stuff. Okay, okay, the final thing, because I know we've got to wrap this up or it'll, yeah. it'll end up being Joe Rogan duration, <laughs> three yeah. and a half hours. Um, let's finish with the one that I got you to do that. Here's one I prepared earlier tweet. Uh, the one that I asked you to make, if you were in charge of public health for the entire world, not just the rich countries, what are your six rules for maximum health and hormonal calm at this time of life? The big middle years, roughly, you know, mid forties, mid seventies. Okay. So I didn't, <clears throat> I'm going to give that to you off the top of my head without, I didn't, I didn't, think about too much but writing it down but it, it, i i pretty much know this <clears throat> i would tell anybody again as far because of my the way that i see diet and hierarchy of diet i'm going to say that number one is you need to build a diet around prioritizing protein and good quality protein it's going to be the best thing for keeping you healthy keeping you lean <clears throat> and longevity second rule is going to be also dietary it is going to be to at all costs, do the best you can to refrain from eating refined sugar and vegetable and seed oils. Um, the, th those two are probably the most poisonous things that have led to this, you know, pandemic of obesity and type two diabetes. And um, so, anything you can do to you know to get seed oils and refined sugar out of your diet. Three would be. People need to do a better job building their strength. Um, whether or not you're someone who likes to do aerobic exercises, there's nothing wrong with that. But people who are going to be living longer and longer need to learn how to go do some strength training, either in their own home or at a gym or whatnot. But because that is so tied into immune function, that is so tied into healthy bones it's so tied into longevity and we know that you know th th there's a big problem when people get into their later age and they have this what we call sarcopenia where they're losing muscle mass and strength rapidly um it's it's not a good quality of life so in the 40s if you can start that process 
of doing something, even, you know, yoga is very strength. So it can be something like that. If you're like intimidated from the gym or something like, so that, that would be another one. Um, I would have to put up there to both get outside, but more importantly, to expose your skin to sun on a repeated basis, as much as you possibly can has all kinds of benefits to health and, and sleep and uh, immune function and production of vitamin D. So that one would be a big one. Um, and the grand finale, number six. Well, be a comment, it would be take care of your hormones. Okay. And so what, what I would mean by that is you need to find that if you need to do more than just diet and exercise and get sun to get proper hormonal balance, um, and get your metabolism back, then seek out what you need to do. Is that through proper nutritional supplementation? Do you need to take that next step into considering bioidentical hormone replacement therapy? Do you need to talk to someone like myself who can sort that out for you? But take care of your hormones and find out what you need to do in order to optimize them. Yeah, and it's really a process of elimination, isn't it? Advocate, yeah. research, and and figure out who you can go to for the advice that you personally need to sort out your individual issues. All right. I can't thank you enough for this. Functional medicine, Dr. Jay Wrigley, joining me from the Dominican Republic. And uh, you can follow him on Twitter and Instagram at Hormone Diet Doc. Love to hear what you think of this episode. There's a heck of a lot in there. And I didn't get to half of what I prepared, which is always the case at the big middle here. Um, there is a place for your thoughts on the episode show page at my website, susanflory.com. So park any queries there and, and I can probably flick them to you, can't I, Dr. J? If we get some that are along the yeah. same line, some clarification on things. And you can engage directly with me at the big middle pod. So Thanks so much, Dr. J. It's, it's been really great. I've learned a lot. Bye-bye. Susan, thank you. Bye-bye.